as we turn in our Bibles, if you have one there in front of you or if you have your phone, you can turn in your notes also out of your, uh, out of your Bible, uh, out of your bulletin. But maybe start in John chapter 11. It's Advent. So today, being the Sunday that it actually starts in December, so sometimes it's end of November, but it's today, December 1st. How many of you had something to open this morning because it's the first day of Advent? Let me see. What was it? A what kind? Fishing lure Advent count. Nice. How many of you are jealous? That you're, yeah, and that's not bad. There's a practical. Anybody else have one that you've opened? Yeah, what is it? Do you hear that? Aldi's, the chocolate. Done. <laughs> Done. Yeah, we have the same one, and that was nice. I actually snuck it last night because nobody was paying attention. We also have, uh, yeah, which one? We have a cheese one. Where'd we get that thing? Goodwill? <clears throat> oh, Sam's Club. So, yeah, so we have a cheese one from, uh, from Sam's Club. That's delicious. According to our calendar, Christmas is coming in 10 days, yeah, because Emma was with us this weekend, and she's like, pop, that's a good one. That's a good one. And so we went through quite a few of them uh, yesterday. So that's great. Yeah, cheese and chocolate, the lures, really? That is nice. I read online that Tiffany and company have an Advent, um, an Advent calendar type bracelet. It's $112,000. So who has that one? That's because we have, yeah, I thought you did, right. Cause, because we have a, um, a, a building program we want to start, and that was a way to find out who you were. So, um, so that's good to know, note to self. And um, it's been going on. Advent is not a Catholic thing. It's not a Lutheran thing. It really is a Christian church thing, and it's been going on for over 1,500 years. It looks as though around the late 400s there began this way in which to prepare our hearts and minds for Christmas. Because today, isn't it about uh, shopping and finding the good deals, and it's the chaos of it. That's okay. We need to keep, though, to the main point. And I think Advent just simply helps us to do that. And whether it's a, a wreath with candles or it's a fishing lures, that's nice. Um, it's, uh, it's a great way, and the first typically, and it will be this year, the first Sunday is often uh, speaking of hope. Not like the world hope. This is different. The world's hope, and this literally, it's a definition issue. The world's hope is kind of a desirous ex expectation. I, oh, I just sure hope they find a cure in, in time. Oh, I sure hope my car starts, right? Hope I can figure out how to pay for college. It's a desirous expectation, and that's how the world uses the word hope, and that is not the way the Bible uses the word hope very different. When we say that we hope in God, we say that our hope is in God, it is a confident expectation. Think of that a moment. If you're not familiar with that, remember this. It's confident expectation. My hope is is in that Jesus Christ supplies my needs. That's not, oh, I hope he does. No, I have a confident expectation that Jesus Christ will meet my needs. 
in this season, even the colors of the candles represent it. The three dark candles are the evening sky. It's the dark sky as there's a darkness, and yet we're anticipating in hope that the sun will rise, and the Sunday before is the pink uh, candle, and then finally the coming of Jesus, it's the white candle. But three of the five are dark. Three of the five, there is no look that there is going to be a coming of anything. It's dark. We think of that in many of our own lives. There's no way out of it, whatever it is. You feel trapped. There's an uncertainty. I remember a, a junior high pastor that worked for me, a junior higher, his dad his, had passed. And I remember what he told the kid. In compassion and love, he was such a good pastor to junior hires. And he said, your normal has changed. It's not going to be back like it was. It'll never be back. You'll never get over the loss. But there'll be a new normal. And you might be in that transition from, I don't like this. I, I liked it like that. Maybe it was because of a job or finances or relationships. It's the dark. And three of the four Sundays preceding Christmas are represented by the dark. But we hope in God, in Heavenly Father, as we spend a few minutes together. Would you please help us to grasp the beauty of this idea, this concept? In Jesus' name, amen. If you have those notes, the first one is that God's promises are over the top. His promises, you got to watch how this works. You see, he's promised us a lot. In fact, in the Bible, some count as many as 5,000 promises in the Bible. But think for a minute. Out of that huge number, many of them have come and gone meaning the promise was made and the fulfillment took place. Many of them, they're promises that are yet to happen. They're promises yet to happen in your life. Well, that's how we have confident expectation because we look to see what the Bible has said, what Jesus claims and what God claims to do for you. We look at those things and we see that they are fulfilled over and over and over and over. And so we go, ooh, he really is that amazing, isn't he? So you trust him yourself. You trust him through a difficult time. And then you start building the very same list of fulfilled promises, and his credibility just keeps growing. So think for a minute. Has he been faithful to you? Uh, not to those in the Bible, good for them, I love seeing that, and I needed that or to those around you, or your parents or grandparents? Is he faithful to you? Have you trusted his promises, and have you seen him come through? On a side note, generationally, this is very difficult, because very often there's a generation that lives on relevant answers to prayer and promises fulfilled regularly. The next generation repeats those, but doesn't have so many themselves. And then the third one doesn't remember these. This didn't mean anything because they were living off of the first generation, and they don't have any of the promises fulfilled, and they don't live with the confident expectation. 
that's actually kind of deep. You can think about your family. You can think generationally of where you are in that line. You might have had parents who didn't care at all about Jesus and fulfilled promises. That's very possible. But you do. So you're that represented first generation. But our goal as parents are to pass on to our kids the relevancy of hope in God for themselves, not living off of my stories. Are you catching this? That's very, very important. In fact, as parents, we have to monitor this. I want to talk about fulfilled promises, and I want to show how God has been faithful in Sarah's life and my life and our family, but we're watching. We want them to live for their stories so they can have a confident expectation. There's a story that it's endless, and I'll look at the one. It's John eleven twenty five. There are so many. But he said that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. John eleven twenty five. 25. My God shall supply all your need. Do you believe that? This is it. This is a promise. I don't know because my car still doesn't work. Yeah, we're going to have to start thinking through what needs are. What are actual needs? Is he fulfilling the needs? Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. That means he is your nourishment daily. This is far deeper than my car doesn't start. This is far deeper than you lost the job. This isn't that he's going to just be the magic genie. He actually fulfills promises, the depths of promises in our lives. Uh, Those with, I've noticed those families with a child with a special need does things with that child that are actually best for all kids, (laughs) but it just seems like they do it more because they have a kid with special needs. And we having one that we knew was never going to drive a car, or as he would say, I'd never drive one legally because of his loss of vision. Never watch a sports game. He's got this great uh, sports fury. Is this fun group on YouTube, these two guys, I think they're in different states, that call NFL games. And, and Do you know of that group? Yeah, they're, uh, and they're hilarious, and Grant listens to them all the time. They're not even at the game, right? They're just calling the games as they're hearing it and watching it, but they're just, and they're funny, and Grant loves it, and, but he'll not watch a game. And think about your child and whether there's a special need or whether it's just your child, your grandchild. As much as you want to say, I'm always going to be there for you. It's not true. That would be false hope. You will not always be there for them. Maybe not by your choice. You need anything. You come to me. Really? So keep building that. Oh, keep conveying that. Keep conveying to your kid that all they that you're going to be the pillar in their life. To set them up at that point in which you're gone. And now what do you tell them? So then the pendulum swings the other way, and we go, okay, that's, that's true. That's unwise. You word it different. Hey, I always want to be there for you. I'll do anything in my capability. I, I'd give my life for you. But I may not be there when you need me. I might not be able to help you. So then the pendulum switched to the other side that we say, I want to teach them independence. They need to be able to stand on their own. Also disastrous.
As a parent and as a grandparent, we live in a dependency on a relationship with God, faith in Jesus Christ. I'm dependent on that. And that same dependency I want to teach our kids. You can hope in God. You can have a confident expectation that God will meet your needs. We want our kids and our grandkids to be so tied to God that when we are taken out of the picture and in the odds, not if, but when we're taken out of the picture, that's typically the case. Oh, they'll stumble a little bit because they're going to miss the times. They're going to stumble because they're going to miss the relationship. But they're just fine because they hope in the promises of God. If we have a target as a parent, I just named it. Oh, I want my kid to have a car and I want him to get to college and to the best. Good, 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 good. All of that. Or get training in a special field. I love it. Let's do all of that. But top of the list is the promises of God are so spectacular that we want to live with this hope, this expectation that God fulfills them in our lives and he will equally fulfill them in their lives. The second point is the advent of Jesus is what made this all so practical. Made this practical because he faced the same things that we face. He literally walked and experienced and saw abuse and rejection. He looked at the lives of people with addictions. He was a hero one day and he was a villain the next day. He had all of that. The reason we could trust him he experienced the same things. He knows what it feels, whatever you're facing. He's experienced it. He's like, oh yeah, like it was yesterday. We had our middle child in town for a few days with her husband. It was Emma. And, uh, and Emma's always just a party waiting to happen, unpredictable, who knows. In fact, we were on the motorcycle last night. Was that last night? She's like, you're going to take me for a ride? And I'm like, well, you know, it's 24 degrees outside. She goes, that doesn't matter. So there we are cruising downtown Washington in our, um, on the motorcycle, uh, freezing, by the way, absolutely, totally freezing. I'll never forget as she was, she meant this uh, she meant this serious. She wasn't like being, wanting to be offensive. She just has a natural ability to be offensive without knowing it. That's, that's a gift. And uh, I remember she was junior high, and we were just doing something, and she, like, literally that little mind of hers was wondering, Dad, have, have you ever, were you ever cool? And I'm like, I, wow, I think I'm offended. Like, am I not cool? And then it was like, it was like, she was like, oh my goodness, of course not. Like, I can't even believe that you're asking, but that's why I'm asking, were you ever cool? And I'm like, of course not. <laughs> I mean, no, I was, yes, I was cool. Yeah. High school, 80s, madras plaid sport coat and yellow pants. Cool. Every shirt had an alligator on it. I mean, they all did. Somehow, a child doesn't think their parents understand. That's just kind of, they don't get it. Am I right that you could give your kid advice? They will dismiss you because you have no idea what you're talking about. But a complete stranger can tell it to them, and they think that they're genius. And you're like, I told you that very same thing. Oh, no, you didn't. That was, a, that was the most useful advice I've ever... I've said it to you. Well, the truth of the matter is, we were all young, in principle, went through the, all the same things. And it makes a difference. When you start to realize 
the pains and struggles and uncertainties. The parents had it. All of it. Some you'll never know. Some they'll tell you. Right? Jesus Christ experienced it all. He was there. That's why we hope in Him. That's why we have a confident expectation that His promises are fulfilled. You've been betrayed? He goes, oh, you know my betrayal story. And we're like, yeah, I'm sorry. He goes, no, 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 it's okay. I can get you through it. I can get you through the betrayal. You say, my family, it's, it's nothing like it used to be. It's so broken for whatever reason. And he goes, oh, yeah, I had everybody turn on me. He goes, I didn't have anywhere to lay my head. It's okay. Because he can relate. If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior... He can relate to you. The pain and suffering that you're facing, He can relate. He's been there. He's walked it. In principle, everything you faced, He's faced. And He's come out saying, I can fulfill all of your needs. You need need fulfillment in life without somebody or something, he goes, I can get it for you. I am it. Then the beautiful Christmas passage, you can turn there, it's Isaiah 9, 2 through 7, the beautiful Christmas passage of our hope in Jesus Christ. Isaiah Actually, six. Six through seven, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the increase of the government and the peace, there'll be no end. That's what he provides for us today. This is 700 years before the first advent of Jesus, and it was predicted that his name, Wonderful Counselor. You need guidance and direction? Yeah, keep asking your friends. It's all fair game. They're, they're useful. Go to the right people. Go to a counselor. Pay to go to a counselor. There's a reason they get paid. They give good advice. They'll help guide you. But the great, wonderful counselor, our hope is in him. Almighty God. Boy, everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. There's a passage, and we'll end with it. It's it's Romans 15. Romans 15 is a beautiful, very Adventish text. And mark it. In fact, it's on the bottom of your insert, your sermon insert. I actually cut mine out. I just kind of cut across just so I'd have it. And I, it kind of sits around a little bit just so I can see it and remember it. But in the context of hope, it's Paul's prayer. May the God of hope, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you're downcast, if you're struggling with some uncertainty, I want you to grab hold of this passage like it's your life. To take this verse throughout your week and just look at it when you're driving and since you look at your phone, you might as well look at a verse. Shouldn't do either. But I'm just saying, have it sit up, tape it to your mirror, have it laying out. Because the beautiful expectation that we have, may the God of hope fill you 
with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You and I think it's going to be when something changes, when maybe that disability goes away, or when there's a cure, when this relationship's brought back together, where something's restored. No, no. You and I have a beautiful expectation. The God of hope can fill you with peace and joy as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the confidence that we have in our relationship with you as we celebrate this first Sunday of Advent. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.